only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's Pediatric Cardiomyopathy 101 webinar. We're very happy to have recently begun to offer this new support service to our members, and we also welcome members of the Mended Little Hearts organization joining us tonight. Please let us know your thoughts and feedback after the webinar, as well as any suggestions you have for future topics. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If at any point during the presentation you need any sort of technical assistance, uh, please type your concern in the chat window. If you have any audio issues, you should be able to switch between using your computer speaker system um, with your phone, with calling in with a phone number if needed. In order to provide the highest quality session today and avoid background noise, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged during the presentation. Um, questions can be submitted via the question box located on your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will be reserving the last 15 minutes of the presentation for questions. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation by typing them in to the question box as you think of them, and then we'll go through them at the conclusion of Dr. Jeffrey's talk. If the control panel is preventing you from seeing your, the presentation, the screen, you can hide it by clicking the button with the small arrow to the left of the control panel. We'll also be recording this webinar so that we may offer it to anyone who is unable to attend live. I'm posting it on our website for, for viewing later on. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter tonight. Uh, we are thrilled to have Dr. John Lynn Jeffries as our webinar presenter this evening. Dr. Jeffries is an Associate Professor of Pediatric Cardiology and Adult Cardiovascular Diseases and is the Director of Advanced Heart Failure and Cardiomyopathy in the Heart Institute at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. He completed his combined pediatric and adult cardiology training at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, at Texas Children's Hospital and the Texas Heart Institute. He has authored and co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters on cardiomyopathy cardiovascular genetics, and adults with congenital heart disease. So, Dr. Jeffries, I'm going to turn it over to, to you um, for the presentation. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And um, I'm just going to give you, show your screw. Oops, sorry. It's just, sorry about that. Okay, here comes um, Dr. Jeffries' screen. Bear with us for one moment. Not yet. Oops. Okay, we see it now. Great. Okay. Thank so you. Thanks again uh, for the invitation and uh, uh, great uh, support for the CCF and everything that they're doing and. I'm uh, very honored to have the opportunity to speak to you all about cardiomyopathy. Uh, we'll try to make this as uh, complete as possible, recognizing this is a very large topic. In uh, 45 minutes, we'll touch on all of the uh, genetically triggered cardiomyopathies. We'll answer as many questions as we possibly can, but I'm more than happy to field emails or questions following the talk. So, um, this talk is really specifically devoted to the uh, to the talk of the cardiomyopathy, and we'll talk about cardiomyopathy here specifically, meaning disease or pathology or abnormality of the heart muscle itself. And there are various causes of this uh, throughout uh, the world. The, the cases we're going to comment and focus on this evening are the genetically triggered cardiomyopathy, but there are other acquired forms um, which uh, may um, uh, also be seen in pediatric clinics as well as adult clinics. Most common cause of acquired heart muscle disease in the United States is going to be secondary to coronary disease or what we call ischemic cardiomyopathy. But there are other pediatric forms that are acquired, such as infections in the form of things like viral myocarditis, which can also result in cardiomyopathy. I'm sorry, Dr. Jeffries, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're getting a couple of comments that it's it's difficult to hear. Okay. Um, is that any better? Um, I, that sounds a little bit clearer. Um, if everyone can, if anyone that's still having issues can just type it in the chat box, and I will, um, I will let you know again. But it sounds, it sounds better. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, no problem. 
Um, so tonight we are going to uh, try to delineate further about how the cardiomyopathies are very heterogeneous. So even within a specific type of cardiomyopathy, the way that those patients present can be very different even within the same family. So neocardiomyopathy you know, can be, be consumed uh, in conjunction with other diseases or it can be secondary to treatment for other conditions. And so, for example, we you know patients may have uh, kidney disease that might require a transplant. Um, and this would be something that could result in heart muscle disease. They could have high blood pressure. Um, a common thing that we deal with is exposure to agents such as chemotherapeutics, which can result in heart muscle disease as well. We also know that cardiomyopathy can be from different kinds of infections. So the most common thrust is viral, but in other parts of the world, bacterial causes can result in heart muscle disease, as well as fungal infection. And we also know that cardiomyopathy, because it's really just a, a description of the heart muscle not, being, not behaving normally, it, it definitely can sometimes be confused with, um, with congenital heart disease. And congenital heart disease, what we're talking about is a structural abnormality. So perhaps um, a defect in the wall or a defect in the venous or arterial uh, structures that are associated with the heart. And that's something that's, that's uh, evident at birth. So it's there. And actually, congenital heart disease, not widely known but, um, by many people, but the, the most common birth defect is actually congenital heart abnormalities. And the typical quote of congenital heart disease occurring as far as an incidence in the United States is about 8 in every 1,000 live births. And so um, this uh, can also be uh, seen in the adults. We can see a, a, a 1 in every 150 adults in the United States may have some form of congenital heart disease. When we talk about heart muscle disease, though, that's a little bit different um, of a, a, a different diagnosis. So it's not typically what we would consider discreetly a structural abnormality. I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that in a few minutes. But this is something that you could be born with as far as heart muscle disease. It is something that can develop over time as well. And when we use imaging uh, strategies like an ultrasound of the heart, uh, which would be an echocardiogram, that can usually be a point in time where we can say you do or you do not have congenital heart disease or structural abnormality. So that's kind of a one-time opportunity to say things are normal, but things may not be completely normal. So that means that this is not typically an acquired problem over time. If it's not present, it shouldn't be present later on in life. But when we talk about heart muscle disease, that actually can also be diagnosed by echocardiography. But it doesn't, is it, it isn't a static process, meaning that if you have an echocardiogram and you don't um, and you don't have heart muscle disease, it doesn't mean that the risk is completely zero. It's something that can develop over time. And so typically when we talk about the risk of heart muscle disease, whether it's genetically triggered or acquired, it's something that you have to be continued surveillance for to make sure that it's something that doesn't crop up in, uh, in later stages in life. And unfortunately, this is a misconception that we deal with occasionally with people who well, I had a one-time echocardiogram and it was completely normal and I'm completely fine for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And Dr. So, Jeffries, I'm, I'm sorry again. There is, there's still some um, some difficulties uh, with the audio on some on some attendees. Um, so let's see if I can do anything to try and help. Okay. Know. Does that help any? Um, it's maybe perhaps a little bit better. Uh, there's several people that said that it sounds um, muffled or like there's an echo. Um, and so I don't know if, if also for the people that are listening, if you can adjust your volume settings or yeah. anything like that as well, yeah, that, yeah. Might, that might help. Yeah, I'm using a, using a head uh, mic, so it should be about as clear as I can make it, I think, right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. If, if it doesn't work, I can switch over to the phone, but I think it may be a little less... Uh, Less optimal, but we'll keep trying. Okay. And I apologize if people can't hear; they can always email, and I'm happy to clarify. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so we know some patients with congenital heart disease can develop heart muscle disease or cardiomyopathy, and this could be secondary to a lot of different reasons. Some of it may be the genetics, which are behind not only the structural abnormalities of the heart, but also can result in heart muscle disease. But we also know people that have surgery for congenital heart disease can develop heart muscle problems secondary to things like cardiopulmonary bypass. And so it's a complicated issue. They can definitely coexist. 
Um, but what we're probably going to spend most of our time on this, this evening are people that don't have evidence of congenital heart disease, meaning they don't have structural disease, but they have primary heart muscle disease. Um, we also know cardiomyopathy can develop in the setting of other abnormal organ systems, such as kidney abnormalities, which I was alluding to earlier. So when we talk about cardiomyopathy uh, in general, there are five sort of bands or buckets that we typically put heart muscle disease in and to sort of uh, to, to classify. Um, the first is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, second is dilated cardiomyopathy, third is restricted cardiomyopathy, fourth is left ventricular non-compaction, and fifth is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, or sometimes um, uh, known as uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. We're going to talk about all of these um, over the next few minutes. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease that we have a lot of experience with, and it's a, it's a relatively common disease in the general population. We know this is a heritable disease, so that means it's a genetically triggered disease, and it can run in families. And when we talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we're talking about an unexplained thickening of the left ventricle or the pumping chamber. And I'm going to show you some examples of this on echocardiography. And it, it really is not just this gross sort of thickening that you can see with echo, but when we look at it, it actually occurs at a cellular level that things aren't um, behaving exactly normally. And you look at the bottom of the screen, you see that on the left, you see normal cardiac tissue. And it's very well layered, you know, just like sheets of, of uh, bricks or dough or anything. It's certain very discrete layers that go down, down, down. We look at hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it actually is very disarrayed. So instead of being these nice, uniform layers of heart muscle, things are just uh, in sort of a, uh, an unusual and unpredictable array. But what this translates into is it means that the heart muscle can't squeeze very efficiently. And this results in a lot of problems long term, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So, as I said, this is a very common disease, actually. And if, if one in 500 people, and that probably underestimates uh, the prevalence in the population. So likely, um, you know, or just people that you would see in an airport or in the mall, there's someone there that has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's an important disease because of a couple of reasons. One is that um, the, in our adults, for example, many patients may present with unusual heart beats or complications, and they have chest pain, and they feel short of breath. But the most common symptom that we have in our pediatric group for that have ACN is that they're completely asymptomatic. And the problem is, is that the presenting symptom may be a, a sudden death event. And so that's why this disease is such a big deal for us. And it's the major cause of sudden death in people less than 30 years of age. So it's very important um, to make sure we identify patients and then to make sure that we do everything we possibly can to avoid these sudden death uh, scenarios. And so what we do, um, we, we actually have a, a sort of a, a, a broad approach to, to cardiomyopathy in general, but definitely for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is that we want to make sure we diagnose the disease correctly. So that's going to include some kind of imaging study, typically either an echocardiogram, so the ultrasound of the heart, or an MRI uh, of the heart. And usually those would be done in conjunction with each other, where we would do both kind of imaging modalities. And there are advantages to doing both that I can talk about offline if people are interested. And for those patients that are old enough, for our pediatric population, we would also do exercise testing. So usually around six, seven years of age, kids uh, can be mature enough where they can actually get on a treadmill and do testing and do a treadmill test. We also have uh, geneticists involved in our clinic and genetic counselors because we do know that this is a genetically triggered or or transmitted disease. And so understanding the genetic trigger and the spelling is very important, not only for the patient, but for their family. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that in just a minute. So if you look on the left side of your screen, you'll see a normal echocardiogram. So this would be someone, this is a completely normal study. So when we look at this, this is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. So this pumps blood out to the lungs. And then we have the left atrium and the left ventricle. So this chamber receives blood from the lung, and this chamber pumps blood out to the body. And this is the chamber that we're interested in, the left ventricle. 
can even appreciate here the relative degree of thickness. So this is all heart muscle here. And this sort of black area is where the blood would be. The patient on the right up here in the right hand corner is hypertrophic. So you can appreciate how much difference the thickness of the heart muscle is compared to this. So what we're looking at in this view is actually cross cutting the heart right here and looking at it from the top down. And you can appreciate here that this heart is very thick compared to what we see on this side. And you can see this in, with a still frame view that what we're talking about is that this inner ventricular septum, the, the wall that separates these two chambers in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is typically very thick. And that leads to a myriad of problems. It blocks the ability of blood to leave from the heart, so this is the outflow tract. But it can also cause other problems such as arrhythmias, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So we talked about HCM, and, and as I said uh, in the beginning, this isn't a comprehensive talk. There are a lot of nuances in medical therapies and device therapies that we're just not going to have the time to discuss. This is going to give you a general overview about what the typical approach is to someone with these kind of different types of cardiomyopathy. So in our place and in most institutions, the consideration of medical therapy may be one thing that's instituted if you or your child is diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the typical class of medications that we use are either beta blockers, and they've been around for decades that we use for, for various uh, cardiovascular reasons, or we may consider an alternative class of medicine called calcium channel blockers. And all of these medicines are very tried and true, have been around a long time, and all of the medicines that we use are generic and are widely available. And the reason we use that is typically to help uh, to make sure that blood can actually get out of the heart so it's not enough the ability of the heart to become obstructed. Um, we typically use these medications to help to avoid that happening. There are some cases where we know that there's a risk, like coming back to that idea of patients less than 30 years of age dying suddenly, we know that that's typically mediated by um, rhythm disturbances, either the heart is beating too fast and um, some of the ventricular uh, chambers are conducting heartbeats at a very, fast, uh, very fast rate that leads to passing out and can lead to sudden death. We also know that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have uh, disruption of the way the electrical activity actually is transmitted through the heart. And so oftentimes we may consider a defibrillator in certain cases to avoid patients having an untoward event in the form of a sudden cardiac arrest. We're very careful about how we use these devices. There are accepted uh, indications for defibrillators that we won't talk about this evening, but um, they are more commonly used in our adults than our pediatric patients. But we definitely have a reasonably large cohort of uh, pediatric and adolescent patients with defibrillators that um, are placed because we have a very high suspicion that a sudden cardiac event may occur from an unusual heart rhythm. And these defibrillators are there to watch guard the patient 24 hours a day, seven days a week and to shock the patient with a bad heart rhythm first and potentially save their life. We also sometimes will consider surgical therapy for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's a procedure called a myectomy, where we actually remove some of that thickened heart muscle that I was showing you on the echocardiogram. And the uh, we do that for is to relieve that obstruction so that heart, so that blood can actually get out of the heart. We do that very rarely in pediatric patients. Um, it's, it's done relatively commonly in the adult world, um, but we don't do it as often in pediatric patients simply because it's a pretty big deal. It's an open heart procedure or actually carving out heart muscle. So we reserve that for the extreme cases. And I wanted to take a, just a brief minute to talk about, we talk about genetic testing, and this is going to be a lesson that's uh, applicable to all of these cardiomyopathies. But sometimes it's helpful just to understand what we're talking about when we need genetic testing. What is it that we're trying to figure out? And so, as you all know, all of us have DNA, and those DNA sequences are what gets get ultimately translated into proteins, and that's what the body runs on. And all of our uh, uh, organs and everything else are dependent on adequate proteins being developed. And those are uh, synthesized based on what your DNA, DNA reading is. When we talk about the DNA, sometimes we talk about having changes in the spelling of the DNA. And you can appreciate that here at the bottom what we're talking about. That we may look at a normal DNA sequence and it changes, you know, we may read A A A G T A C T A. 
they talk about a mutation, which is what we're going to be testing for for patients for this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example. We're talking about one of those letters gets misspelled. And so instead of a T, perhaps it gets a C. And that ultimately results in this product in this DNA sequence when it's converted into a protein. The protein doesn't behave exactly normally. And that's the problem with the mutation. And it's hard to imagine that one tiny little misspelling of all of the DNA that we have can result in such serious heart disease. But it's very well accepted and very well known and very well studied. And so when we talk about genetic testing, this is at least one aspect of genetic testing that we're looking at when we do uh, DNA sequencing. And for the diseases we're going to talk about this evening, for the most part, we're talking about what's called autosomal dominant inheritance. And what that means, you can look on the right hand screen, this would be a pedigree of a family that has an affected individual. So in this case, the father is affected, so he has one of those genetic misspellings that I was talking about. And it occurs in one copy of his DNA. So you have two copies of all of these genes. Well, when, they, when the parents have offspring, one copy is transmitted from the dad to the offspring and one copy from the mom. When we talk about autosomal dominant inheritance, that means if one of these affected copies is given to one of the children, that they're also going to manifest the disease potentially in some way. So that's what we're talking about is autosomal dominant. So that translates into a 50-50 chance of the offspring uh, inheriting one of the mutation. And it's 50-50 for each child. And so you can appreciate here if they have a family of four, two of the children were affected, two of the children weren't. But it's completely 50-50 each time, meaning that they could have four children and none of them were affected, or they could have four children and all of them were affected. But when we talk about these diseases, we're talking about that 50-50 opportunity to transmit something to your children. And this just makes it a little bit easier, I think, for people to understand when we talk about what do we actually mean by disrupting DNA and mutations. If you look at the top sentence, the big red dog ran out, that would be a normal sequence. But if you change one letter, things start to make less and less sense. And let's say we start losing the words of that sentence, or we actually shift components of that sentence, the, the sentences start to become more and more abnormal. And you can appreciate how this would potentially disrupt the way the proteins work. Just like if you're trying to understand the sentence and it makes no sense to you at all, the protein structure is not dissimilar in that way, is that it's not going to function in a normal way. And so hopefully you can use that information during the draft and talk to kind of understand what you mean by genetic mutation. And we're talking about diseases such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I put this part in and just simply as an illustration. And so we're typically talking about diseases of what's called the cardiac sarcomere. So these are the muscle structures within the heart. And these are some of the proteins that we're talking about that can be affected in diseases such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, such as troponin, uh, troponin I, troponin C, troponin T, myosin binding protein C, um, beta myosin heavy chain. These two, beta myosin um, heavy chain and myosin binding proteins, are by far the most common mutations that we see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if you undergo genetic testing, that may be something that your physician talks to you about, and now you'll at least have an understanding of what we're talking about in these mutations. And these proteins being abnormal interferes with the way that the cardiac muscle functions. So we'll move on to the next phenotype for the next type of cardiomyopathy, which is dilated cardiomyopathy. This is very common, and it can be either that genetic trigger that I was talking about, or it can be the acquired form, which is very common in developed nations. So this idea of ischemic heart disease, so people have blockages in their coronary arteries, when they have heart attacks, for example, this is the way that their heart will ultimately end up. So you can appreciate on the left, this is that pumping chamber that we've been focusing on relatively triangular in shape, and you can appreciate what happens in this dilated cardiomyopathy, where the heart physically dilates out, so that's where the main comes from. But the other piece is that the chamber doesn't squeeze very well, and I'm going to show you some pictures to illustrate that a little more clearly. And this is a very common cause of heart failure, and it's a very common cause for the cardiac transplant. So this is that normal echocardiogram that we were looking at again, and this is the chamber we're going to be paying attention to. The left ventricle. 
this is a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy so that is that same chamber that I was showing you before. But look how different it looks. It almost looks like a basketball. It's big and spherical. And you can appreciate that the way the heart squeezes is nowhere near as good as um, in this picture where you can see the chambers coming in very well and squeezing. This heart almost quivers because it's not squeezing very well. So this is an extreme form of dilated cardiomyopathy. And when we talk about uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, once again, the symptoms can be very, um, very broad. And patients may present with feeling short of breath. They may have fatigue in our kids. They may have problems with weight gain, with feeding. But in our children, once again, the most common presenting symptom for us for a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy is none. It's typically asymptomatic. There are adults symptoms are usually more evident. And that gives us a little bit of insight into what we're treating and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we know that people with dilated cardiomyopathy may present with progressive heart failure. And I'm going to talk to you briefly at the end about what we mean by heart failure. Um, they, we know that they can have reduced cardiac output, so that means the ability to deliver blood to the tissues can be compromised. They can have unusual heart rhythms. They can have problems with the way the electrical activity is conducted in the heart. They can have blood clots, which can ultimately result in a stroke, so a clot in the heart can be flipped off to the brain. Or they can have a sudden death event, like we were talking about with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So all of those things make this a very important disease for us to pay attention to and to make sure we get the diagnosis right. When we talk about the, the reasons or the etiology behind some why someone might have dilated cardiomyopathy, we know that acquired, as Dr. said, is very, very common. So this is people with high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol abnormalities. But the genetic causes are also increasingly common. And just like those gene spellings I was telling you about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the same thing can be evident in dilated cardiomyopathy. And if you ever go to see a practitioner about um, dilated cardiomyopathy, they may tell you this term idiopathic. But what that typically means is that we don't have a clear reason for why the patient has dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning they don't have blockages in their arteries, they don't have diabetes, these sorts of things. Well, it turns out that the more that we research this disease, the majority of these patients that we're calling idiopathic, or meaning we don't know what the cause is, when we actually start looking closely, they end up being genetic in nature. So that comes back to that idea of being heritable, running through families. And so this is a pretty important breakthrough when we talk about dilated cardiomyopathy because it gives us the ability to understand the patient and also their family members, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about that later on. This is just a, a sort of a quick catch-all of why we think people have dilated cardiomyopathy. We're talking about genetic mutations, infectious etiology, such as viral infections, and we've heard a lot in the news over the last couple of days about a, a virus, an enterovirus, that's causing cold and flu. But those viruses can also infect the heart muscle. So that's what we're talking about with a viral infection. We talked about things like uh, chemotherapeutics, such as azithromycin. Um, but there are other things that can cause uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, for example, thyroid abnormalities, adrenal abnormalities, and other parts of the world, things like nutritional deficiencies, such as vitamin B1 may result in dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is just a list of the things that we think about if someone comes to see us with dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning what could be the cause. And the important thing is, is there anything on here that's reversible? So things like electrolytes or sodium or potassium or nutrition, nutritional deficiencies like B1. We can actually supplement those, correct those deficiencies, and potentially make the heart muscle better. So we always look for these things that are reversible when we talk about someone with heart muscle disease. Um, when we talk about the treatment of dilated cardiomyopathy, there are a lot of medical therapies, and of all the cardiomyopathies, this is the one that has the most research behind it and the most medical and surgical strategies devoted to its care, which is you know, dilated cardiomyopathy. You may hear about use of medicines called ACE inhibitors, which is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ARDs, which is angiotensin receptor blockers. And these are medicines that you've heard about, drugs like bisinopril, analopril, or ACE inhibitors, and ARDs are drugs like Losartan, Valsartan. We 
we also use beta blockers. Um, we typically use two beta blockers in, in the R factors. One is a drug called metoprolol. The other drug is a drug called carbidolol. And we use these drugs typically in conjunction with each other. And we really use diuretics to help people from a symptomatic perspective. Drugs like Lasix or furosemide oftentimes will be used to decongest patients, meaning they're slower and they can't breathe well. We use these drugs to make them feel better. Sometimes we will use um, devices such as pacemakers and or defibrillators based on risk factors that we don't have time to talk about this evening, but if the electrical system is disrupted or if there's a concern of one of those sudden death events, we would talk about a defibrillator. And then dilated cardiomyopathy is the type of heart muscle disease where we talk about using things like ventricular assist devices and we make read about these in the news or um, see them on TV. These are called LVADs or VADs. And a lot of people across the United States have these devices. We're using them more and more frequently in our pediatric populations, uh, mostly as a way to measure a uh, failing heart, so a heart that's not doing very well from where we are now to the ability to get a cardiac transplant. And then lastly, obviously, we use uh, cardiac transplant for patients that have severe disease that otherwise can't do well, can't do well, can't get out of the hospital. We would talk about offering up a cardiac so left ventricular non-compaction is our next disease, and this is a disease that I spend a lot of time with and we have a strong research interest in. But what we're talking about is simply that the heart muscle doesn't develop exactly normally. And you can appreciate here that in the normal heart, like what we saw in this echocardiogram before, the heart muscle is relatively homogeneous. So there's heart muscle all the way around the, uh, the inside of the heart here. There's normal thickness where we'll see this populated with heart muscle all the way around. We look at left ventricular non-compaction. We're actually talking about a disease where there are these sort of crevices or holes within the heart muscle where there should be muscle, but instead it's just an open space. And so blood actually goes down into these crevices. And these areas are called trabeculations. And in and of itself, it tells us that the heart muscle is probably not normal because we shouldn't have these deep sort of crevices in here. But the other piece is that it can be associated with problems with the way the heart squeezes, the way that the heart relaxes. And so it's an important disease simply because, for one, it hasn't been widely recognized over the last few years, but it's increasingly being diagnosed. But it has a lot of associated morbidity with it, meaning you can have those squeeze problems like I was talking about. You may have heart failure. You can have those blood clots and potential for strokes. You can have unusual heart rhythms. And you can have sudden death. And so recognizing this disease and being followed for it and treated appropriately is very important in my mind. And this just gives you an illustration of what I'm talking about, about why the heart uh, doesn't look exactly right. And so uh, during gestation, the heart mus muscle is being formed, being formed. And usually, in early development, everyone's heart has these areas in the left ventricle, these, what I would I explain it to patients sort of like stalagmites, so those things sticking up out of the floor in a cave is kind of what it looks like. Usually those go away in a process called compaction in normal development. But in some patients, that doesn't happen. And we'll explain a little bit more about why that is in a few minutes. Um, and it's mostly about just this idea that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the heart is usually because of there's some genetic reason, just like the cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or with dilated cardiomyopathy, there's some genetic signaling that tells the heart not to compact completely normally. And so we use echocardiography, it's very common and it's very available, and that's how we diagnose this disease most commonly. But we also can use cardiac MRI, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that. But this is a, a technology that can be used for all of these heart muscle diseases that we're talking about. But the thing that's important is it gives us wonderful pictures, um, and it gives us an opportunity to look for scar tissue. And this is what's called fibrosis, and we do this in the form of late gadolinium and cancer. And I'm going to show you some pictures. So this is back to our normal echocardiogram again. And this is what a heart looks like with left ventricular non-compaction. So once again, there's big stalagmites that are sticking out of the floor of the cave, you see these recesses where blood is going down into the heart muscle. Very abnormal looking heart muscle. And this is just a still frame view of that disease again where you can see this is where the blood is and you can see blood is going to be flowing down into these holes 
first, the heart muscle should be more like this, where it's all homogeneous and there aren't these big crevices. That's what we're talking about with reference to the amount of compaction. This is what the MRI would look like for that same patient. And you can appreciate the level of detail is much greater. When we talk about MRI, I liken this to having high definition TV. When we look at echo, it's more like the black and white TV where you see stuff, but it's not crystal clear. Here, the MRI images are fantastic, and it really shows us how deep these crevices are, how extensive they are. Um, and it's a very reproducible technology, and it can be discussed over and over and over, and the image will look exactly the same each time. The other piece is that we can use this to look for the scar business that I was talking about. So we get a contrast agent called gadolinium. We actually see where there are areas of the heart muscle that have been damaged. So you can appreciate, and this is the easiest segment to see, this black donut is that pumping chamber in the left ventricle. And it should be all nice and black, like what we're seeing up here. But in this heart muscle, we see areas of white. And that's the area of what we would call late gadolinium enhancement, where we're seeing areas that this is where the heart muscle has actually been damaged, and this is fibrosis. And that's an important thing for us because and that only tells us what kind of medical therapy we would be thinking about. But it also may give us an idea of patients who may be at an increased risk of having unusual heart rhythms like intracranial tachycardia. So when we talk about the treatment of LMNC, we really base it on how thick the heart is, like what we saw with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, how big the chambers are, how well does the heart squeeze and relax. We know that there's a propensity for the patients with LMNC to develop abnormal heart rhythms and that might change our management. And then ultimately seeing how patients are being given have any kind of symptomatology, which may require us to attend the game. And these are some of the genes that are responsible for left ventricular known compaction. And if you remember back to our sarcomere slide, some of these names look very familiar. So it's important to beta mice and having chain mice and minor vitamin C. So what we're seeing is that some of the genes that are responsible for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy also been implicated in dilated cardiomyopathy as well as electrocular myopathy. We'll talk very briefly about our final two um, myopathies, restrictive and then um, ARVC. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a pretty rare disease. So when you think about PF cardiomyopathy in general, it's somewhat rare compared to other diseases. But in the cohort of patients that have heart muscle disease, Restrictive is one of the more rare forms that we see. It's less than 5% of the total of patients that we see with cardiomyopathy. And it's an important disease because we know it runs in families, but compared to some of the other cardiomyopathies, at least in our pediatric experience, it's associated with a higher mortality. So it's a very serious disease when we make the diagnosis because we know that patients with RCM are at an increased risk of a bad event in the form of sudden death. And we know that it's relatively common in, in our pediatric patients that have a genetic trigger for having restricted cardiomyopathy. We know that uh, these events are oftentimes related to unusual heartbeats coming from the bottom chamber, so ventricular or ventricular. But we also know that the heart rate can get very slow to the point where it actually stops this event called base systole. And so it's important because we can actually potentially treat these things the ventricular arrhythmias can be treated with a defibrillator, and the brain arrhythmias and asystolic events can actually be treated with a pacemaker. And so these are important considerations for when we manage patients with restricted cardiomyopathy. But the most recently reported data that we were a part of would suggest that the two year survival with this disease is around 50%. And so oftentimes we'll talk about the idea of cardiac transplantation. When we talk about this disease, RCM, it's typically a problem with the way that the heart relaxes or what's called diastolic heart disease. They can have problems with heart squeeze, but it's not usually for later in the course. So when we see patients with RCM, typically their heart squeeze is reasonably well preserved, but the ability of the heart to relax is greatly compromised. Um, we know that the top chambers can become dilated, and I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a second, but that the bottom chambers actually a pretty normal size. And so this is what restricted cardiomyopathy looks like. So you, and sometimes when you look at it, they almost look like Mickey Mouse ears, these top chambers, because they're very enlarged and very circular. And they're almost as big, if not bigger, than the bottom chambers, which is very unusual, remembering 
back to what our normal echocardiogram looked like. So this would be the characteristic imaging finding of someone with restricted cardiomyopathy. And so just coming back, we'll, we'll go over our four phenotypes that we've seen so far. This would be that restricted cardiomyopathy, so those big uh, chambers. This would be a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so very thickened heart muscle in the left bedroom and it also can be involved in the right. This is that dilated cardiomyopathy, so big dilated pumping chamber that doesn't squeeze very well. And this is left ventricular non-compaction, those big stalagmites coming out of the floor of the left ventricle that stick out into the body of the pumping chamber, um, which is exceedingly abnormal, and that's called DMC. Um, and when we talk about the restrictive cardiomyopathies, when we talk about the management, oftentimes one of the discussions will employ um, consideration of cardiac transplant based on those data I was telling you that our two-year survival rate is about 50%, which is not very good. So oftentimes patients may be managed with a transplant. At our center, we've taken um, a, 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 a sort of a parallel route where there are some of our patients that we do pursue cardiac transplant, but coming back to that idea of um, asystolic events and ventricular tachycardia, we've been employing the use of implantable cardioverted defibrillators to help to avoid those arrhythmias and bad outcomes. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that for HCM and for ECM, we've talked about medical therapies. There are really no effective medical therapies for restricted cardiomyopathy except to help with symptoms in the form of giving water pills and briefly talk about arrhythmogenic right, ventricular cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy as it's more commonly known nowadays. And this is a very rare disease, but it is something that we see a fair amount of here in Cincinnati. And I'm going to show you some pictures so you understand more about what I'm talking about. But what we mean is that we in the in the right side of the chamber typically that can occur in both chambers, the replacement of the heart muscle cell with fatty tissue. And I'll show you some pictures so that makes a little more sense uh, about what I'm talking about. So we, we lose heart muscle or replace it with fat and with fibrous tissue or scar tissue. And that leads to serious problems. It leads to electrical instability. It leads to the inability of the heart to squeeze well. And that ultimately can result in sudden cardiac death. It oftentimes is also inherited in that autosomal dominant fashion, like I was talking about, this 50 50 opportunity. But it also can occur in different kinds of genetic contributed uh, forms, such as autosomal recessive. We know it's serious disease because if 40% of patients that are initially diagnosed with ARDC experience sudden death as their first manifestation, so they didn't have shortness of breath, they didn't have palpitation, their first event was sudden death. And so that's why it's very important for us to screen for patients and to treat them appropriately if we're worried about this disease. And the treatment for this disease is typically using that defibrillator that I see that I've been talking about. And this is what I'm talking about with replacement for the heart tissue. It's where you can see heart muscle tissue out here. But this white stuff is all fibrous and fatty tissue where we should be seeing the red and blue filaments here. We're seeing all white. You can imagine the electrical activity of the heart trying to go through all of this kind of stuff. It needs a wall. And that leads to some of these unusual heart rhythms that we've talked about. And these are some of the genes implicated in the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The thing to note is that we haven't seen these genes on the other list. So these are a different type of genetic triggers than what we're typically talking about for the other types of cardiomyopathy. I want to spend about three or four minutes, and I'll try to finish as much as I can. Um, we've talked a little bit about heart failure, and I just want you to be familiar with what that term means. Really what we're talking about is the inability of the heart to deliver um, blood effectively, either because of a relaxation abnormality or a squeeze abnormality. And this is just a, a slide that you can look at, and all of these are, this is all in our online, it's like the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association. But this is what we're talking about when we talk about heart failure. And this is something that you can look to help you to understand if the appropriate management strategies are being employed. Um, and we start over here with patients that are doing well without any symptoms moving all the way over to the right side where patients are very symptomatic and may be considered for meeting the cardiac transplant. Um, and I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll finish up my last couple of slides. Um, we know for our treatment strategies, the first thing we want to do is not do any harm. 
And that's very really important in our pediatric population because we know kids are little adults. And these are some of the therapies that we've talked about tonight that are at least bibliographic representation of where they're working and things such as beta blockers and things of which we have discussed. So to finish up, we know these heart muscle diseases are very um, heterogeneous, they're very variable. And but we also know that you have to manage them based on what the heart actually looks like. We can't use the same kind of management for dilated cardiomyopathy as what we would use for ARDC, for example. But I hope what you take away is that a misdiagnosis may result in a bad outcome. And so really being thoughtful about the approach and the treatment is of the utmost importance. We know every opportunity must be taken to diagnose patients early. And we know that screening is imperative. So if there's a fam of course, three family member that has uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, screening those first three relatives is hugely important in early diagnosis and potential treatment. We use genetic testing as a way to screen family members. So if we can find a misspelling in the DNA, we can do blood samples of all the at-risk individuals and see if they carry that mutation or not. And it offers us an opportunity to say you are at risk, but it also gives us an opportunity to say you are not at risk because you do not carry that misspelling. We know that that's only part of the management tool, but it's an important clinical tool for the family. So when we talk about heart disease in kids, remember children are not little adults. We strongly advocate the idea of management by a qualified healthcare provider that has expertise in cardiomyopathy. And if a team where you live is not uh, available, you, there are opportunities to develop collaborations between identified centers of excellence, which uh, CCF can easily help you to identify. And those centers can co-manage you or your family in conjunction with your local cardiologist. So make sure you treat the, uh, the treatments have to be considered carefully because they can have good effects, but they can also have bad effects, and you have to make sure that they're done at the right time. And I think most importantly, if you're dealing with someone who understands heart muscle disease, it helps us to understand the right use of resources, the right uh, management decisions, the right sort of counseling strategies, and most importantly, I think that ultimately leads to the best outcome for you and your child. So with that, I'll stop. I apologize for a little bit over, but I'd be happy to answer any questions in the time that we have remaining. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffries. That was great and very informative. Um, we do have um, questions submitted, so we'll do our best to, to get through as many as we can. And as Dr. Jeffries mentioned, um, if any questions don't get answered uh, right now, um, we will correspond with him um, after the webinar and, and we'll email you um, his comments on all of the questions that, that may not um, be answered tonight. So everyone's uh, questions will receive uh, attention. So, um, in a patient with LVNC and DCM, uh, the enlarged part of the heart can get can uh, get smaller and the function can get better. But is it that the ventricle will always will the non compaction always remain, or can that ever change as well? Great question. So, um, so this is one of those things that people are typically born with, and those trabeculations or those um, sort of stalagmites we were talking about don't typically go away. They may change in size a little bit based on how well the ventricle shrinks, um, but those trabeculations will be there lifelong. The important thing to know, because obviously you want to do the right kind of surveillance long term, but if we can see a patient who responds to medical therapy in that way where the heart squeeze goes up, and the size of the ventricle goes down, we think that's a hugely favorable prognostic sign. So that's a good thing. But those trabeculation finger-like processes will be there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the next the next question comes from a parent who has um, a son diagnosed with HCM at age two, and today is 11. Um, he is scheduled um, for a myectomy and a mechanical valve replacement in one surgery, and uh, the parent is wondering if this is common for this um, condition to have um, the, the valve replacement and also um, how long that valve would last or would it need to be have, have subsequent surgeries, and is it common to have this happen all in one surgery? Understood. So I can tell you, you know, like I said, our experience with myectomy, we follow lots and lots of patients with HCM. We don't do a lot of myectomies 
Um, there are other institutions across the country that do pursue myectomy more commonly than we do. When you see someone as young as age two, where they're really progressing, and by age 10, pre-adolescents are moving towards the need for myectomy, they have pretty severe disease. So meaning comparatively to the general HCM population, they're on the far end of the spectrum. Um, myectomy can be done and can be very beneficial. And it's usually in the setting of where the patient's having symptoms or has a lot of obstruction, even in the face of getting the right kind of medical therapy. So the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers we talked about may not be effective or as effective as we need to mitigate this obstruction. So there's still blockage to the blood coming out of the heart. Mechanical valve, or, or, I mean, a, a valve replacement in the setting they see in pediatrics is not hugely common. We know that there can be associated valvular abnormalities, and that may necessitate a valve replacement. Sometimes in our pediatric patients, we would try for a valve repair, where we don't actually replace the valve, but we try and go in and fix it. That's obviously going to be dependent on the patient and how the patient looks, what kind of symptoms they're experiencing. And you know, a qualified surgeon is going to be able to tell you that they did that a combination surgery with my plus valve intervention is going to be appropriate. Valve replacements in kids, um, depending on the size of the patient, um, can be very as far as the duration of the life of the valve. It depends on whether we're talking about a mechanical prosthesis, so one that's actually a metallic or some other man-made structure, or um, more of a bioprosthesis where we use uh, an a actual uh, tissue valve of some sort that may be porcine or bovine, where we replace the valve and it's not a mechanical valve, so you don't require uh, blood thinning medications, for example, like you would need for a mechanical valve. The problem is with those bioprosthetic valves is that they do wear out over time, and the time course for that can be very variable. So you want to talk to your surgeon and see what kind of valve are they talking about, what are the pluses and minuses to each one, and how big of a valve can they actually fit in. Maybe is a valve that's going to be adequate for when your child is an adult. Uh, or is it one that's going to have to be upsized over time? So the combination of those in a pediatric patient is not common. I definitely we care for patients that have had that sort of a wrap, but I think it's indicative of pretty severe disease. And I think you want to you know really have long discussions with the surgeon about are there any opportunities to potentially repair the valve? If replacement is a necessity, understood, then that's just what has to be done. Then you want to really talk about what kind of valve we're talking about. What longevity are we going to get out of that valve? Is it going to have to be upsized over time? Those are the sorts of questions you're going to want to know. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question related to myectomy. Um, if you could comment on during a myectomy when the part of the muscle is removed, what are the effects of scar tissue taking its place? Good, good question. Um, so when we talk about myectomy, and maybe I can... Um, maybe I can find uh, a slide that can kind of show you what I'm talking about. Um, so um, we would be actually talking about coming in, if you can still see my slide, and carving out, so they'll come down through the aortic valve, through the aorta, and actually try and carve out part of this heart muscle, okay? And you can imagine, you don't want to carve out too much because you actually may go through the wall and come over to the other side. You can also disrupt the, the electrical system here in the heart. So it can lead to a need for things like pacemakers, for example. So it's a pretty, it's an, it's an important surgery. It has to be done thoughtfully. One thing that people don't recognize all the time is that this heart muscle can actually grow back in some patients. So remember, this thickening response is in the gene, so it's not like you're going to cure it with a surgery. About 10% of patients that have a myectomy can actually get regrowth of that piece of tissue that was carved out. So let's say you take out from this line all the way over, that could grow back over time. Um, it does create some scar tissue. You can imagine with the surgical line there, that's absolutely true. But when we talk about the scar burden in something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's a diffuse process. So there's no doubt that that's going to contribute to some scar. But we're talking about scar potentially all around the heart, even on the right side of the heart. So when we talk about my concern of Scar tissue is not, is not a, a, a huge part of the discussion, per se. There's an alternative strategy for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy called a septal alcohol ablation, which we don't use. It's typically 
what we do do in adults, that creates a lot of scar tissue. And that is actually a concern in the facet of that particular intervention that you might create a lot of scar tissue in the heart and may predispose people to having unusual heart rhythms like ventricular tachycardia. So we're pretty careful about going down that path. But myectomy in and of itself, the thing we really want to be paying attention to is not so much about where it's heart tissue, but are we relieving the obstruction so that blood can get from here to go outside of the heart? That's really what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another parent um, asks, I'm told that cardiopulmonary metabolic exercise testing is very accurate to determine functional capacity and the level of cardiac impairment. Um, what, what are your comments on, on this test and what it can inform us of and, and what it can tell a doctor? Very thoughtful comments. Uh, uh, that, that sums up a lot of uh, cardiopulmonary testing. It is very informative in a lot of ways. It tells us about uh, what the capacity of the heart is, what you can really do with exercise. It also tells us about this idea of deconditioning, right? I mean, that perhaps people with exercise fatigue um, and ability to do the things they want to do, maybe because they haven't been doing things in a long time, as opposed to uh, deleterious effects of the heart muscle itself. The testing itself is very important because we've spent a lot of time talking about cardiac disease. But the heart is not a standalone organ, and it interacts with multiple other organ systems, so the lungs being a very important one, meaning if you have primary lung disease, your heart uh, function is going to be compromised, and if you have heart disease, your lung function is going to be compromised. We also know the heart interacts with the liver, with the kidneys, with the brain, so it's a very intricate milieu. It's not just talking about cardiac disease, it's about talking about all of those things in general. Cardio testing, such as uh, CPX testing, is very informative in a lot of patients, like I say. It gives us an idea of level of uh, capacity. It gives me an idea if the therapeutic strategies that I'm using are making a difference. It gives me an opportunity to refer patients to things where, uh, such as cardiac rehabilitation, which we didn't talk about tonight, but we could spend a whole other hour just talking about the idea of cardiac rehabilitation. It informs us for some patients who may benefit from transplant. So their numbers on there that can give us an idea of that. So all these things, it's a very good test. The limitation of kids is that not everyone is old enough and mature enough to be able to do the testing. Meaning it's a great test. It may give me uh, information not only from a diagnostic perspective, but from a prognostic perspective, but it's very hard to do in a four-year-old. So our use in adults is much more robust than it would be in our younger pediatric population simply because of the capacity to do the test. So in our patients that we can use uh, exercise testing, we do it uh, basically on everyone because we do think it adds to our understanding of the individual that there are going to be limitations. Patients may be too young to comply, or they may be too old. Maybe they have formal arthritis, so they're not ambulatory. They could also not do that test. So there are age spectrum limitations to doing the testing, but in a qualified lab where you can actually do adequate cardiopulmonary testing, it's very informative, and not just for heart muscle disease, but for things like aortic insufficiency as well. So it's an important diagnostic test. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, we I, we're looking like we're just about out of time. So um, we we still have um, numerous questions that um, again we will certainly get these questions to Dr. Jeffries offline. And Dr. Jeffries um, has graciously agreed to um, to comment on the questions and uh, via email. And then I will send out all of those comments um, to the participants. Um, after the, the webinar so that your your questions will still be answered. Um, so we apologize for running out of time for all the questions. Um, but we just wanted to, again, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with the group tonight, Dr. Jeffries. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, this is very helpful, very informative, and we thank everyone for your attendance. Um, there's going to be a very brief survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Um, if you can take a few minutes to fill it out, it's just a few questions. It helps us to to um, gauge our future programming as well for, for what the needs of our community are. Um, and also, just a friendly reminder that September is Children's Cardiomyopathy Awareness Month. Um, CCI 
ICF is sharing awareness activities and different um, stats and information about the disease on a daily basis. And so this webinar was today's activity um, as a learning opportunity for, for anyone interested in learning more about cardiomyopathy. And again, it's going to be posted on the website. So anybody that's interested, um, you know, to educate, to get educated a little bit more, even if it's um, somebody from from the the public that just wants to learn more about the cause during our awareness month it's a great resource so again we're very appreciative of of dr jeffrey's uh time and and sharing his expertise with us um but please everyone visit our website if you haven't already and our facebook pages uh for more information we post we post there on a daily basis with a lot of uh really exciting awareness activities and different um different uh, information that you can you can share with with your friends and family as well, um, and and to be a support to to our families. Um, so again, thank you everyone for your attendance and have a great evening. Thanks a lot. Take care.